So far in the book, Sam is trying to rescue Lily from the family that she's currently living with because they've not been very nice to her. So they're kind of hatching a plan um, to meet. Um, can you remember when they were going to meet or where they were going to meet? Yep, they were going to try and meet at the gate and I think about four o'clock because it's ration day and Lily's got to go and get the, the rations for the family. Okay, chapter nine. Lucky for some. A copper bell jangled feebly above their heads as Sam and Lily entered Hargrave's grocery store. The shop was surprisingly quiet and when the smiling shopkeeper waved a customer goodbye, the two children found that they had the shop to themselves. Got my eye on you two, the large man warned them, a round belly strained to escape through a white apron tied around the man's thick waist. Sunlight bounced off his balding scalp as he winked at them. I close in an hour, so don't be dawdling. Lily drew near to her cousin as she stared at a lightly stocked shelf. Trays of fresh white eggs seemed to gaze back at her like bulging eyes. Beside them, Hunks of cheese and butter rested on cold plates. Another shelf held staples like sugar, tea and small pots of fruit jams. Both children resisted the urge to reach out and snatch a pot for themselves. It had been months since they tasted anything as delicious as sweet, sticky jam. Sam heard Lily's stomach groan noisily and he wondered if his cousin was imagining feasting on buttered toast and strawberry preserve. Sam could feel his cheeks tingling as his mind conjured similar thoughts. He stared longingly at a stack of freshly sliced bacon rashers, remembering how his mum used to fry his until they were crispy and then pack four at a time into his Sunday morning breakfast sandwiches. Times had certainly changed since Hitler had sent his stormtroopers marching across Europe. The shelves look half empty, Lily whispered. I thought things were bad in London, but there's hardly anything here. As if sensing his young customer's concerns, the shopkeeper leaned against his countertop. Light from the bulb hanging from the ceiling bounced off his pink scalp as he said, It's been a busy day. I haven't had time to restock shelves. Should we come back tomorrow? Sam asked. No, 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 don't be daft, lad. The shopkeeper laughed. If you can't see what you need on those shelves, I'll have it in the back. It's my name on the front so I'll make sure folk round here can count on me. Who are you shopping for? Sam nudged his cousin. Oh, uh, Mrs Scales from the... The smile faded from Mr Hargrave's lips. Scales Farm? Aye, I know it well. His cheeks wobbled as he blew out a mouthful of air. There's a lot of mouths to feed down there. You're going to clean me out. Do you bring the book? Lily delved into her pocket to retrieve a small, creased Ministry of Food ration book. It was identical to the one owned by her mother, right down to the two sharp staples holding the thin sheets in place. She handed it to the shopkeeper, who immediately turned to a large ledger resting beside his till. He ran a finger down a list of handwritten names, pausing only when he had almost reached the bottom. They certainly like their grub down on Skill's farm. He grumbled. He squinted at what looked like a fresh entry. Says here, there's one of them evacuees staying with them now. I guess that'll be one of you. Lily nodded slowly. Mr Hargrave's eyes gazed at her gently as he told her, Aye, nothing lasts forever, lass. This war will be over in a jiffy, and then you can go back down to London. If there's anything left of it, Sam said. Both children jumped as Mr Hargrave slammed the large cardboard packing box down onto the wooden counter step. Hey, we'll have none of that talk in my shop. Our lads are going to give Jerry a right good hiding. Just wait until you see. He snatched up the ration book and opened it wide. Now then, let's get this show on the road. I always start with eggs. One each per week means half a dozen. I'll let you bring them to me. For the next ten minutes, the shopkeeper directed both children around his store like a skilled puppet master. Six lots of butter, he told Sam, pointing at the shelf. Two ounces each. And bring me six four-ounce packets of margarine, too. That's on the shelf below. 
Lily was given similar instructions. Six lots of everything. Eight ounces of sugar, two ounces of cheese, and more bottles of milk than either of the children had seen in a long time. Are you sure this is right? Lily asked, putting the last of the eighteen pints of milk on the shopkeeper's counter. Sam wondered how she was going to get it all back to Scales Farm. Aye, love, Mr Hargreaves nodded kindly. Three pounds each. Not a lot when you think about it, especially when it's got to last an entire week. I have to limit myself to two cup of tea a day, otherwise my missus complains that's not enough for a weekly baking. He rubbed his stomach. And we can't be having that. To collect the final item, Lily had to ask Sam to pull a pack of dried egg powder from the shop's highest shelf. Behind them, the shopkeeper was busy dropping thin four-round packages of rationed bacon and ham into their box. Each one offered barely enough protein to fill a sandwich. However, despite the paltry portions, Mrs Scales's rations all seemed to be adding up. As a grocer reached under his counter, he told the children, Now, I know that Mrs Scales always likes her fresh oranges. Trouble is, since those Jerry submarines started blocking our convoys, oranges have become a bit scarce. He gently placed a small paper bag onto the countertop. But some clever farmers over in Wales have started growing black grunts. We've got plenty of these now, so tell Mrs Scales I popped a bag in the box to see how she likes them. As Sam gazed at the box filled with food, he began to understand why Mrs Scale was so keen to host a lodger and an evacuee. More people meant more rations. Lucky for some. Mr Hargrave scribbled a final row of crosses in the ration book coupons to show that Mrs Scales had received her full quota for the week. When he had closed the book and his ledger, his gaze darted towards the shop window. After quickly scanning the quiet street outside, he dropped his voice to ask, Did, er, uh, did, er, uh, Mrs Scales give you out else? Suddenly remembering, Lily dipped her fingers into her other pocket and fished out a crumpled brown envelope. The shopkeeper opened it up and read the small letter inside. A single banknote was pinned to one corner. He nodded silently before creasing the note into his pocket as he shuffled it into the back of his store. When he returned moments later, Mr Hargraves' apron was straining even more. You haven't seen this, right? He said as he moved back towards the counter with surprising speed for a man of his size. Seen what? Sam asked. Mr Hargraves gave him another one of his winks and patted Sam's head as he passed. That's the idea, lad. I like a fast learner. As Sam and Lily swapped befuddled shrugs, the man pulled two bulging packages from beneath his apron. Each was wrapped in brown paper, and the corner of the largest dripped with what might have been blood. The end of a thick sausage pierced the corner of the smaller package. Hey, that's not part of rationing, Sam pointed out. At least not where we come from. The grocer put a fat finger to his lips. This is what we like to call black market portions. I don't ask where to butchers get their spare meat from, and they don't ask who I sell it to. That way, everyone's happy. Sam felt a familiar tingle as his mouth began to water. I haven't had sausages in months. Mr Hargraves tapped the bulging package. These awful sausages are a real delicacy. There's not quite like a bit of trap and tongue to add flavour. Suddenly, Sam didn't feel quite as hungry. Awful. Aye, the grocer nodded. That's not rationed yet. You can have as much cow's cheek and udder as you want, as long as you've got the money. Lily gasped. I thought there was meant to be a food shortage. The shopkeeper laughed sharply. Aye, and there's fairies hidden at the bottom of some folks' gardens too. Lily's eyes widened. Really? Of course not, Mr Hargrave chuckled. But if you believe everyone has to go without during rationing, you might as well believe in those fairies. You should try living down in London, Sam told him, pointing at the box of rations. My mum says knitted mist is easier than making our rations last a week. The grocer tapped the end of his nose. But I'll wager those folk into fancy London houses don't have to go hungry. Lily turned and puzzled gaze towards her cousin. 
rich people. The grocer laughed. You don't think His Majesty and Mr Churchill's government are scratching by on one egg a week like the rest of us, do you? But that's not fair, Sam complained. While us normal folks starve, others still have full plates. Aye, and life's always been like that, the man said. But who says any one of us is starve? Sam stared back at him. The government? Aren't they the ones who introduce rationing? Rationing is there to control the food we're allowed to buy, the shopkeeper continued. But there's nought to say you can't grow your own food too. Why do you think there are no flowers in any of the gardens up here? Everyone's dug them up to grow their own crops. There aren't many gardens in London, Lily lamented. Sam nodded in agreement. Not where we live anyway. The big man smiled at them both. But we're not in London, are we? We're in good old bountiful Yorkshire, and that means there are fields and woodlands and even the sea. And all of them are like a generous larder of free nosh. You just need to know how and where to get your hands on it. Chapter 10. Fishing for free nosh. Mr Hargreaves seemed eager to deliver the groceries to Scales Farm himself. Sam wondered if that was because he'd be picking up another banknote for his troubles. Lily didn't seem to care. Sam could see that his cousin was just happy not to have to cart the heavy box of rations back herself. Her host hadn't volunteered any money for bus fare and there was no way that Lily would have been able to carry all of that food alone. This meant that she now had some unexpected free time and a constant grin told Sam that she was looking forward to sharing that with him. Can we go to the beach? she asked. I heard the two brothers talking about a mile of sand. Her eyes widened at the thought. What do you think a mile of sand even looks like? Sam didn't tell Lily that he'd already seen the beach several times, in fact. Nor did he tell her that if the waves hadn't made their way back up the beach yet, he'd be able to show her the footprints that he'd pressed into the sand before breakfast. Auntie Joan always said the sea air was good for you, Lily reminded him. Sam grinned as he thought about his mother. Yeah, but she also says that Pontefract cakes can cure stomach ache, and those things are disgusting. At the thought of those small licorice sweets screwed up Lily's face, Sam grabbed her hand. OK, I'll take you to the beach, he said, but I want you to meet Mrs Ward first. No, Sam, Lily objected, dipping her head to remind him how shy she was. Another time. Now, Sam insisted, tugging her gently. You need a good square meal, and Mrs Ward would love meeting you. The thought of a plate of freshly cooked food quickly drained any reluctance from Lily's face. In seconds, the two children were sprinting down from Filey's High Street, laughing as though worry and fear had both been abolished forever. Filey's quaint village streets felt almost deserted. A hodgepodge of white and cream two- or three-storey buildings lined the main shopping street, seated atop glass shop fronts like a family set of crowns. As Sam stared up at the uneven mixture of gables and chimneys and turret-framed rooftops, Lily both busied herself with peering into the shops themselves. The window displays were sparse, perhaps reflecting the country's current lack of consumer appetite. After all, most people had better things to do with their time and money than shop. It was mid-afternoon, and if Sam and Lily had been in London, they would have been navigating their way through throngs of fellow Londoners. Today, though, they seemed to have the small seaside town almost all to themselves. It's like a ghost town, Lily whispered. Where is everyone? Sam shrugged his shoulders as a screech of rooftop seagulls made him think back to the air raid sirens of home. Maybe this is what towns are like outside London. I quite like it. Don't you? Now, it was Lily's turn to twitch her shoulders. I don't know. I think I prefer it when there are lots of other people around. It was a rattle of laughter that made Lily feel more at ease. A trio of young mothers burst out of a bric-a-brac shop, pulling squabbling toddlers behind them, like dogs on leads. The group gave Sam and Lily a curious glance as they bustled past. 
Across the road, a couple of pensioners emerged from the door of a pub. Tendrils of smoke reached after them like octopus tentacles, filling the air with the bitter scent of pipe tobacco. As if on cue, more people joined them, spilling from a small tea room, the cobblers and the post office. Sam sighed, as though having to share the town with other inhabitants was a disappointment. He quickened his footsteps. His rumbling belly suddenly reminded him that he was hungry. His mind was busily teasing his taste buds with enticing thoughts of what Mrs Ward might have cooked for lunch. So it was a quiet, quiet a shock when he was abruptly bundled through the archway of a damp and dingy alley. Hey! he gasped as his shoulder thumped against a stone column. Shh! Lily ordered, pinning her cousin to the dirty wall. He might see us. The fear in his cousin's voice sent adrenaline flushing through Sam's body. Who? Still welding Sam to the brickwork with her right arm, Lily stretched and peered back out into the high street. Her head jerked left, then right. When she returned her attention to Sam, both eyes were wide with fear. It's Mrs Scales's lodger. They have a lodger? Yep. Some skinny guy called Albert. Or Alfred. No, Albert. Lily shuffled uncomfortably, hugging her own shoulders. He gives me the creeps. He comes and goes when it's dark. I hardly see him. I can smell his disgusting cigarettes, though. But why are we hiding? Lily's eyes didn't leave the street. If he sees me here with you, he'll tell Mrs Scales. Sam rubbed his aching shoulder. You aren't doing anything wrong, Lils. That doesn't matter, Lily hissed. I don't want him to see me. She screwed her face into a map of wrinkles. He skulks around if he's more important than everyone else. He looks at me like I'm dirt on his shoe. Sam tightened his lips. He knew better than to argue with Lily when his cousin was so worked up. Instead, he edged along the brickwork until his chin hovered above her cousin's shoulder. Is that him? Lily's gaze was glued to a tall, dark-haired man who was standing in the high street, speaking in pleasant tones to the town's vicar. Lily nodded, and they both furtively watched Albert, or Alfred, bid the vicar goodbye and make his way down the town's high street. Strong, handsome features and sharp cheekbones made the man look impressive, and at well over six feet tall, he was difficult to miss. He wore a stylish grey buttoned-up jacket and black hat, which he tipped to those whom he recognised as he made his way through town. Various shoppers stopped to wish him a good afternoon or smiled on their way past him. See, told you he was a bit shifty, Lily said. Sam wondered if he was missing something. He's just doing his shopping, Lils, he said, and people seem to like him. They both continued to watch in silence, tracking Albert's every move as he calmly navigated the gentle curve of the road towards the seafront. Sam was about to tell Lily that the lodger was clearly just intent on taking a stroll along the beach when Albert made a sudden detour down a side street. See what I mean? Lily asked. Weird or what? Lily, he hasn't done anything wrong. He's just walking. You don't believe me, do you? Lily looked hurt. Seizing his cousin's hand, Lily stepped back out onto the high street. Lily seemed more comfortable now that Albert was out of sight, but it didn't last long. Let's follow him, Sam insisted. What? Lily snatched her hand back. Why, no! Sam set off down the street backwards, his eyes fixed on Lily's horrified expression. To show you that there's nothing to be frightened of. Lily shook her head, as if her hair were filled with fleas. What if he sees us? He'll tell. He won't see us, Sam promised. Mrs Scales will never know, and once I've shown you that there's nothing scary about him, we can go and see Mrs Ward. You promise? Sam smiled. Scout's honour. He grabbed his cousin's hand again and tugged her across the pavement. Come on. Chapter 11. Caught in the act. You're not even in the Scouts, Lily reminded her cousin as they crouched behind an overgrown garden hedgerow. Sam peered around a stone gatepost. What? You said Scout's Honour, Lily continued. But you've never been a Scout. You said you didn't like the neckties. Swallowing a giggle, Sam said. I've never played for Chelsea either, but I can still play football if I want to. 
He looked back at Lily and winked. Besides, Dad says it all the time, and he's never been a scout either. It just means, I promise, and I always keep those, don't I, Lils? Lily wasn't listening. I can see him. Sam had quite enjoyed tracking the lodger. They'd spent the last few minutes catching glimpses of Albert's grey clothing and flashes of his black hat as he made his way through the town's labyrinth of squashed-in back streets. What's he doing? Lily asked wearily. It was clear that she wasn't enjoying the chase. I think he went down the alley behind the barber shop. Sam moved a stray branch out of the way to get a better view of the street. He definitely doesn't want to be seen. Lily, he probably just... Please, Sam, Lily groaned. My legs are tired. Can't we stop this? Sam paused to study Lily's face and knelt down beside her again. I thought you wanted to know what he was up to. I'm doing this for you. I did. Lily shook her head. I do. I want you to believe me. But we're wasting time, Sam. Mrs Scales will start to wonder where I am soon, and I want to see where you live. Sam sighed. He didn't want his cousin to go back to their host worrying about this man when there was nothing to be afraid of. Besides, Friday didn't seem like the most exciting place in the world, and tracking Albert had been the most fun he'd had in weeks. OK, you stay here, he told Lily. I'll just go to the end of the alley and then come back. Sam felt Lily's fingers grip his sleeves. Be careful, Sam. Something about that bloke isn't right. Lily's words were still fresh in his ear as Sam made his way towards the mouth of the alley. Three-storey stone buildings reached up either side of the one-metre-wide channel. The lips of overhanging rooftops acted as a shield against the daylight, deterring the sun's glow from offering anything more than a cursory shine. When Sam began to edge his way down the alley, he quickly found himself cocooned in gloom. He blinked, feeling as though his eyes were fighting to peer through a veil. Reminded of the warehouses back home, he reached out with his hands, moving his dexterous fingers across the cold stone and mortar. He kept his eyes fixed on the bright strip of the approaching exit in front of him, and when he reached it, he launched himself out into the afternoon light. He blinked as his eyes adjusted, squinting down the narrow street into which he had stumbled. He was met by a row of neat terraced houses on an empty road. The only living thing in sight was a lonely seagull, which took flight the moment it saw Sam. His quarry had vanished. Just as Sam was preparing to turn and head back through the alley to Lily, a voice as smooth as caramel turned his blood to ice. Why are you following me? Sam whipped around, leaning against the cream-coloured house to one side of the alleyway was Albert, his arms folded. He did not look happy. Sam's words failed him. He spluttered like a fish out of water and searched all around him for any kind of response. Why are you following me? Strong hands closed around his collar, violently pushing Sam up against the opposite wall. The solid stone impacted upon his ribs like a boxer's punch, knocking the air out of his lungs. Pain from Sam's bruised chest sent tears spilling down his cheeks as he struggled to reply, Let. Me. Go. Answer the question, Albert snarled. Still in pain, Sam struggled to find the courage to speak. I'll tell the police. An icy expression cracked through Albert's handsome features, telling Sam that his threat hadn't worked. In fact, it only seemed to have made the tall man even angrier and his grip even tighter. Tell them what? The man's accent wasn't a local one, but he wasn't from London either. That you were sneaking around back alleys looking for homes to rob? No, that's not. But that's what they'd believe, Albert sneered. Not wanting to wait around to find out what might happen next, Sam rammed his palms into Albert's chest and drove the heel of his shoe into the man's shin. He was rewarded with a shocked howl and as instinct pushed Albert's hand towards his damaged leg, Sam managed to wriggle free. Sam was pursued back up the alley by a torrent of threats, but nothing else. And when he burst out into the blinding daylight of the street, he was alone. Sam was still gasping for breath when he reached Lily's hiding place. Sam, you're hurt. What happened? Ignoring his cousin's worried interrogation, he grabbed Lily's wrist and frantically began to pilot her towards the safety of Filey's town centre. 
In fact, he didn't stop running until they both rounded a corner and almost crashed straight into their school friend, Thomas Mahoney. Feeling too spooked to stop and chat with Tom, the two cousins continued to sprint through the town. They quickly found themselves scurrying down a narrow street, flanked on either side by the neatly kept gardens of small painted cottages. Sam had yet to grow used to the variety of colours in Filey. Some houses were whitewashed, others were painted green or eggshell blue. One even looked though it had been coated with the yolks of a thousand broken eggs. Why didn't you say something to Thomas? Lily asked as they made their way towards Sam's new home. Sam hoped that his exercise reddened cheeks disguised his embarrassment. Say what? That I followed a complete stranger and got caught in the act. He'd have said I was stupid. He'd probably say I deserved it, too. Tom's not like that. He's your friend, Lily insisted. He looks up to you. Yeah, and that's exactly why I didn't tell him, Sam snapped. Can we talk about it later? Why not now? Lily objected. A white garden gate squeaked on rusty hinges as Sam pushed open. He waved at the small cream cottage that it belonged to. Because we're here, Lily. This is where I live now. Mrs Ward seemed annoyed. She had both hands clamped firmly to her hips and her red lips were pinched tight. I can't believe you've done this, Samuel Hunt, she growled. But we, er, Sam's cheeks glowed like glazed cherries and his thoughts swam in confusion. He'd expected that his host would give Lily a warmer welcome. Lily shuffled behind her cousin's shoulder as Mrs Ward stepped towards her. When the woman grabbed her wrist, Lily tried to pull away but Mrs Ward was too strong. You shouldn't have come here without telling me first, Mrs Ward continued. Lily whimpered a little as a tall woman eased her forward. Come here, girl. Let me have a look at you. Tenderly, Mrs Ward pushed a stray strand of red hair back behind Lily's ear and plucked a fallen eyelash from her cheek. When she next looked towards Sam, warm eyes and a comforting smile told Sam that she was only being playful. You really should have told me that your cousin was so pretty. She wrapped her arms around Lily and pulled her against her chest, surrounding her with affection. Sam was pleased to see his cousin submit to the embrace, but that relief instantly turned to horror when Lily began to sob. Mrs Ward pressed a kiss against Lily's head as she gently comforted her. Now, now, let's not be having tears in this house. There's nothing but love waiting for your ear. Lily buried her face into the soft fabric of Mrs Ward's dress and snaked both arms around the woman's waist. I'm not your mummy, Mrs Ward whispered, but there'll always be a great big hug waiting at this house for you, my love. Oh, and how about a fresh slice of leek and potato pie? It'll still be warm. The food was delicious. Mrs Ward filled both of their plates with a generous slice of creamy pie and then added mashed potato, crushed carrots and cabbage all picked fresh from her own garden earlier that morning. I guess this is what Mr Hargreaves meant, Sam acknowledged, as his host added a fresh dollop of potato to his plate. When he explained, Mrs Ward smiled. The whole town grows its own food. Lots of folk keep chickens for free eggs. Old Mrs Thompson even has a couple of breeding pigs in that big shed of hers, she, she told them. My husband turned our garden into a small holding before he was conscripted. I just harvest the food and replant my seeds. Nature takes care of the rest. What would you do if you didn't have a garden? asked Sam. He cast his thoughts back to London and the tightly packed terrace streets of Bethnal Green. The only thing that ever grew in the cramped backyard of his home was the old flowering dandelion. His host patted a loose strand of hair back into place. I wouldn't like to think about it, Sam. The rations we get don't stretch very far. Without the extras, we grow ourselves. We'd be hungry most days. It's not a lot, but it helps. Lily shoveled pie and carrots into her mouth that was already bulging with delicious food. She chewed like she hadn't eaten in weeks. There's no rush, Lily, Mrs Ward giggled. Nobody will steal your food, and you both might want to leave some space for afters. Sam raised an eyebrow. Afters? With the flair of a magician's assistant, Mrs Ward swept a tea cloth from the dish that it was covering. The smell of some freshly baked delight billowed towards them. Rhubarb crumble. Later, 
as they happily nursed bellies bulging with pie and crumble. Sam and Lily set off for the beach. A gate from the back garden led to a shortcut down the beach, and as Sam steered his cousin towards the narrow footpath, he suddenly paused. Wait, he instructed. I forgot something. There was hope in Lily's voice. More pie? Only if you want to burst, Sam laughed. No, but something just as good. He returned several minutes later, carrying an armful of fishing rods and nets. I can't eat those, grumbled Lily. Sam handed her a large pole net. Maybe not, but we can catch things that can be eaten. How do you fancy fish pie tomorrow? Lily's mouth drooped as she brushed the loose strands of red hair behind her ear. Tomorrow, I'll be back on the farm, watching Vincent and Duncan fill their greedy mouths. Not if I have anything to do with it, Sam promised her. He closed the garden gate behind him and started down the footpath. Come on, Lils, let's go find ourselves some of the free nosh Mr Hargreaves was bragging about. Chapter 12. Footprints in the Sand By the time they had reached the beach, the rolling tide was beginning its slow creep back towards the cliff face. The afternoon's fading sunshine had managed to dry dappled patches of sand, but as Sam and Lily made their way towards a cluster of rock pools, their feet left a trail of damp impressions. To their left they could see a line of small painted fishing boats moored on the sand at the foot of the cliff. A scruffy tidal line of flotsam made mostly from twigs of driftwood, seaweed and torn up fishing nets suggested that the boat sat beyond the sea's reach. By their heads, dusk was already beginning to win its tussle with daylight and the grand sky warned both children that evening wasn't far away. It was Lily's first ever visit to a beach and she seemed eager to make the most of every minute. Sam was having trouble keeping up with his cousin who raced across the sand However, despite her clear enthusiasm, it was obvious that Lily's senses were struggling to cope with the feast of new sights and sounds and smells. The breeze whipping in from the ocean had already turned her hair into a tousled nest, and the salty aroma that it carried pulled sneezes from her nostrils. You'll get used to that, at sea air, Sam assured her. Stretching her arms wide, she turned to look at her own path where her footprints leaned back across the sand. This place is amazing, she gasped. It's so vast. Sam nodded. Shore beats the slimy bank of the Thames. Up. A solemn look draped itself across Lily's face. I wish Mum and Auntie Joan could see all this. Sam did his best to chase her gloom away. We'll bring them back here as soon as our boys beat Jerry. He pointed towards a cluster of dark rock pools that seemed to push through the sand like the stumps of rotten teeth. If we're lucky, there'll be a couple of crabs, or maybe even a lobster, trapped in those waters. Ahead of them, rising high enough to make them strain their necks, was a vast slab of ancient rock. The constant crash and churn of the North Sea had gradually eroded the fragile cliff face elsewhere, but the darker stone of Filey's magnificent brick was made of sterner stuff. It stretched like a huge, impenetrable wall out into the ocean. The rock pools followed its path, lining the Briggs's shadow until the foaming sea swallowed them whole. Sam and Lily weren't the only people hoping to harvest the rock pools. Small figures moved slowly from one rock cluster to the next, dipping their own nets. One of those figures looked familiar. Tom! Sam yelled. Tom Mahoney! Sam was pleased. He'd been feeling a little guilty about ignoring his friend earlier. Now he could make up for that. The wind caught his voice and shredded it to silence, but their friend didn't need to hear Sam's calls. He was already heading towards them. Not in as much of a hurry now, I see, Tom joshed. Sorry, Tom. We were late for tea at Mrs Ward's, Sam lied. Really? Tom gave a puzzled look. Jesse Owens would have struggled to catch you two. I thought you must have been running away from something. Lily stepped forward, eager to change the subject. Where does all this sand come from? It's like a desert. Tom laughed and waved his hands. I know. Check out all this space. It feels like we're in another country. Lily observed, biting her lip as she tried to hide a smile. Brightly flushed cheeks made it clear that she was happy to see Tom. She'd always known that his younger cousin had a soft spot for their school friend, 
and seeing Lily's happiness cheered him up. From the glow of Tom's face, those feelings were mutual. Caught anything? Sam asked, dodding towards the rock pools. Shellfish mainly, Tom said. A couple of clams, some mussels and an oyster, I think. No crabs, Sam wondered. Not yet. They hide under the rocks and in the sand, so they're harder to find. Pamela thinks she's got a lobster trapped, though. Lily screwed her foot into the sand. Pamela? Pointing back towards the rock pool, Tom gestured towards a figure bent over the water. She's a member of the family I'm stand with. Pamela is the one who showed me where the crabs hide. You'll like her, Lils. Sam's mother would have called Pamela Groves a stocky girl. Although a floral dress was wrapped around her solid frame, she looked far more at ease in the large pair of boots that encased her feet. The ragged cut of her hair suggested that she trimmed it herself. Smudges of sand decorated her face and arms, and Sam could tell that she wasn't the kind of girl who shirked hard work. Hey up! She greeted them with a wide smile and friendly brown eyes. When Sam and Lily did not respond, Pamela added, That's back in for look out. Oh, replied Lily. Look out for what? Pamela laughed as she glanced to the sky. Round here, mainly seagulls. They make Hitler's bombers look like amateurs. Sam laughed as he watched a girl delve into a deep rock pool with her fishing net. The water was as clear as glass. Are you going to stand there gawping? Pamela asked. Or do some with that net of yours? Tom leaned close to his two school friends. You'll get used to her. She doesn't mean to be rude. Her mum calls it straight talking. Aye, Pamela nodded as her strong arms thrust her net even deeper into the water. And you'll be straight walking back home with no supper if you don't give me an hand. Lily was the first to step forward, brandishing her own pole net like an eager soldier. What do you want me to do? You can make yourself more useful than them two lummoxes, she said, and pointed towards the largest rock in the pool. I've been trying to cork out a massive crab for the last 20 minutes. It's stubborn as heck, but if we nab it, it will make a cracking meal. A curious crease stretched across his cousin's brow, telling Pamela that Lily was struggling to decode her words. When Pamela glanced towards him, Sam sent a similar shrug to confirm that he was struggling too. Pamela sighed. Just jam the net under truck and give it a good firm shuffle. If we're in luck, the beast will run straight into my net. Having managed to decipher most of Pamela's sentence, Lily gently eased her net into the water and steered it towards the lip of the rock. She had to move to the very edge of the water, and as she strained to guide her net towards the bottom of the pool, the cold sea water began to caress her toes. Pamela encouraged her. Just a bit further. That's grand. Now, jam it left, real hard. Suddenly, the salty rock pool clouded with sand and bubbles. It happened so quickly that Lily jumped back in shock, slipping on one of the rocks and toppling back into the sand in a heavy heap, though unhurt. She was clearly disappointed to see that at the end of her dripping pole was an empty net. None of her companions seemed to notice or care. They were all too busy staring down at the writhing contents of Pamela's net. It's a funny looking crab, Sam observed. That thing's like rock on stilts, Tom leaned away, as though the creature might contaminate his air. I think you should put it back. It's giving me the creeps. Rubbish. Pamela insisted, holding a net aloft like a trophy. Crusty, red legs jabbed and jerked through the holes. It's a spider crab. Those legs are filled with meat. This thing will feed the family tomorrow and we'll still have leftovers for crab soup. The Yorkshire girl grinned across at Sam. There might be another in there. Get the net in there and wiggle it around. Sam wasn't listening. Something unusual and unexpected had caught his attention in the dwindling clifftop light above them. His eyes darted left and right, trying to catch a second glimpse. Someone's up there, he told the others. Look! His friends followed his pointing finger as it guided their gaze to a grassy mound on the clifftop. The eyes were fixed on the shadowy spot when a burst of orange flashes sparked like flames. Looked like someone's got a torch. Pamela said. The quartet watched in silence as more orange flashes continued, some short, 
others long. It seemed to go on for several minutes. Sam and Tom glanced out at sea. The waves had grown choppier as the tide rolled its watery carpet up the beach. Sam thought that he might have briefly spotted a similar burst of flashes, but when he tried to focus his gaze on its source, he saw only the rolling swell of more waves. Why would someone flash a torch from the top of the cliff? Tom wondered, turning back to the cliff top. It's only us here to see it. Dunno, said Sam, but that's not normal behaviour. Maybe someone's stuck and needs help, Lily suggested. Haven't they got a pair of lungs? Pamela asked. Better shout for help than flash some silly torch. More likely they're up to no good. Tom shrugged and wrinkled his nose. Like what? Sam anchored the end of his fishing net deep into the sand, then brushed a handful of fingers through his copper-coloured hair as he stepped towards the cliff. I guess there's only one way we'll find out. Mm. Thinking about the torch, do you know what they're flashing the torch for or what the, the flashes actually mean? Okay, have a little think about it if you're not sure. Try and do a little bit of research.